Hi, everybody. It's time to read Shiloh. It's very shiny. Shiloh, Chapter 5. So yesterday, Marty took the dog. He went outside, and he found Shiloh after he was done eating breakfast. Remember, he made a, a cage or a pen for the for the dog to stay in so it couldn't run away or come down to the house where his parents or his sisters could see it. And now he's kind of hiding this dog. So he's made a decision to be disobedient and to break his own promise to Judd that he would bring the dog back. And well, let's see how he handles that. Any, any of you who've ever lied before, and we've all lied, even I've lied. It's kind of a kind of a sad part of being a human sometimes is that we don't always tell the truth. So Marty's lying and he's hiding something from his parents. I want you to think about a time in your life today where you have hidden something. You've done something you know is wrong and you've hidden it from the adults in your world. And think about how did that make you feel? And I want you to imagine that as we read this chapter. How is Marty feeling about hiding this dog from his parents? Chapter 5. I got to take one problem at a time, I tell myself. Problem number one, where to keep Shiloh hid, solved. Problem number two, would Shiloh be quiet? Yes, he would. Problem number three, how am I going to get food out of the house enough to feed Shiloh twice a day without Ma noticing? The next morning, before breakfast, as soon as Dad's gone, I take a biscuit from the kitchen and a rope from the shed outside and I run up the far hill before Ma and Daryl and Becky get out of bed. This time Shiloh's on his feet waiting for me, tail going like a windshield wiper, fast speed. A soft yip of pure joy cuts, cuts off quick when I say, Shh! But as soon as I'm in the pen, Shiloh's leaping up almost shoulder high to lick my cheek, nuzzling my hands and my thighs. He gulps down the biscuit that I give him. Wants more, I can tell, but he don't bark. Seems to know he's safe only as long as he's quiet. I tie the rope to his collar. Shiloh, boy, we're going for a run, I tell him, to get in and out of Shiloh's pen. I got to unfasten the piece of wire that holds the fence against the side of the tree, then moving the fence aside long enough to slip out. Shiloh lets me through first. He follows, and then we're both together, like a six-legged animal pounding along up the path. Legs bumping, Shiloh leaping up to lick my hand. I let go of the rope, and I let Shiloh run free for a while. If he goes ahead even a few steps, he stops and looks back to see if I'm coming. He stops to sniff at a tree or a bush, and I go on by, but his feet come pounding double time just to catch up. Just out of the woods on the other side of the hill, there's a meadow, and I slump down in the grass to rest. Shiloh's all over me, licking my face sloppy wet. I giggle and roll over on my stomach, covering my head with my neck my head and neck with my arms. Shiloh whines and nudges his nose under my shoulder, working to roll me over. I laugh and turn on my back, pulling Shiloh down onto my chest, and for a while we both lay there, panting, enjoying the sunshine and belonging to each other. What'd you do today, Marty? Dad asks as he gets out of his Jeep later that evening. Oh, looked for groundhogs up on the hill. Fooled around, I tell, I tell him. How's the can collecting coming? Found some a couple days ago. Saw some bottles down in the ditch near Doc Murphy's, Dad says. I'll go take a look, I tell him, and I set out with my bag. I have to keep on collecting cans enough to cover some money for the meat and the bones from the grocer down in Friendly. The bigger Shiloh grows, the more he'll eat. When I get back home, supper's on the table, and I slip into my chair just as Dad asks the blessing. Dear Lord, we thank you for the food you've provided for our table. Bless it to nourish the good within us. Amen. Ma picks up the meatloaf and passes it around, and the meal begins. I eat about half my supper, then say, I've been getting a sort of full feeling at dinner, Ma, and, I, and then I'm hungry again before I go to bed. Ma, don't even look up. Well, don't eat so much at dinner, then, and again, and eat again before bedtime. Food will all be gone by then. Oh, there's always cornflakes or something. But I get hungry for meat and potatoes later. Save some back then. Daryl Lynn will eat it. 
For goodness sake, Marty, Ma says. Who wants cold meatloaf, Daryl Ann says. Forks continue clinking on the table. Becky keeps digging her fork in her boiled potato. No one looks up, no one pauses, no one even questions. Easy as falling off a log. So what's Marty doing? Why is he saying I get full at dinner and then I'm hungry again before bedtime? Oh. See if you can think about that while we continue reading. So he's he's telling his mom, I don't I don't want to eat as much at supper. I want to save some back in the fridge for right before I go to bed. What's he doing? I get up from the table finally and put some of my meatloaf and half a potato in the, on a saucer. I'm putting this in the fridge, Daryl Lynn. I say, don't you go picking at it. I won't, I told you, she says. I go into the other room and sit down on the sofa. So far, so good. You seem restless, Marty, Ma calls. Me? Heck no. I got lots to do. Where's David Howard this summer? Haven't seen him around. I think he went to Tennessee to visit his uncle. Fred? Michael? Haven't seen Fred. Michael's gone to some kind of camp. You're not lonely? How can I be lonely with the whole outdoors to play in, I answer. Wish they'd get off my back. You can ride along with me to work anytime you want, says Dad. I pick up the comic book I bought for a few weeks back. I want to go, I'll let you know, I'll tell him. Grad Gradually, the kitchen clatter dies down. Dad belches and goes out in the back porch to look at the sky, same as he always does. Becky's fooling with their food, and Ma sends her away from the table. Darling giggles at Becky and gets asked to clear the dishes. I wait until everyone is out on the, out of the kitchen and sitting around the back porch to catch the breeze. As usual, Becky and Darling whoop and tumble around in the grass, glad for an audience. And after I sit a respectable amount of time, I say, I think I'll take my 22 up for the up and go up the hill for a while. What you figure on shooting this time of evening? Dad asks. Just working on my aim, I tell him. See how good I can hit a can I can hit when the lights dim. Don't you ever name your gun toward this house or yard, Ma says. I'll point it dead away, I promise. I go back inside for my gun, slip the leftover food from the saucer into a little plastic sack, and set off up the hill. The sounds of my sister's shouts and giggles behind me. Again, as soon as I get near the pen, I hear the soft, happy yips. But as soon as I say, shh, the noise stops. The only sound you can hear is the swishing of Shiloh's tail hitting the fence. The soft pad of his paws as he leaps up in the air in sheer, pure happiness. The sloppy slap of his jowls together as he gobbles down the supper that I brought him. And then he commences to slobber love all over me as well. I unhook the wire, push the fence open, and lead Shiloh to the stream for a drink, filling the pie pan with fresh water. Then I lead him back to the pen again. I can tell he's disappointed. Wanted to go for a run, but I gave him enough hugging and squeezing and petting to last the night, and then promise another run through the meadow the next day. I'm halfway down the hill when I remember I haven't fired my gun once, and wonder if Dad will say anything. By the time I reach the back porch, though, the whole family's facing down the driveway, because there's the sound of a truck motor growing louder and louder. I stop in my tracks. fingers tightening around my gun. Dad, sitting on the edge of the porch, leans forward so he can see. Looks like Judd Travers' pickup, he says. My chest feels all tight like I'm having trouble breathing. The truck pulls up by the side of the house and the door swings open. Evening, Dad calls out as Judd, wearing his old western-style boots with sharp heel, with the sharp heel, gets out and comes over. Evening he says. You had dinner? Ma asks. I got some leftovers I could heat up real quick. Had me some ribs already, he says. Ain't looking for a meal, Mrs. Preston. I'm looking for a dog. He sure don't waste any time getting to the point. Now my heart's really pounding. That new one of yours run off again? Dad asks. I swear to God, I find him this time. I'm going to break his legs, Judd says and spits. Oh, come on, Judd. A dog with four broke legs ain't no good to you at all. He's no dog to me that all the way he keeps running off. It's the fourth time he's left the pack when I had him out hunting. I gotta teach him a lesson. Whoop him good and starve him lean. Wondered if you'd seen him. I sure didn't see him on my route today. 
And you know, if I had, I'd have put them in the Jeep and brought them right straight to you, Dad says. What about that boy of yours? Think he seen him? Dad heard me coming down from the back hill. He turns around. Marty? I, st I stand rooted to the ground at the side of the house. What? Come on around here. Judd's dog's missing again. He wants to know if you've seen him. It, his dog? Here in this yard? I haven't seen any dog of any kind in our yard all day, I say coming a few steps closer. Judd is sure studying me hard. So is Dad. Well, how about when you went out looking for bottles, Dad asked. Did you see him then? Nope. My voice is stronger now. Saw that big German Shepherd of Baker's. That dog gets loose sometimes and saw a little old gray dog. But I sure didn't see that beagle. Well, you keep a sharp eye out for him, Judd says. And if you see him, you throw a rope around him, drag him over, hear? I only look at him. I can't speak. Can't even nod my head. I would not never promise him that. You hear what he asked you, Marty? That says Dad. I nod my head. Yes, I heard all right. Okay, then, Judd says and gets back in his pickup. Have any luck, luck hunting yesterday? Dad calls after him. Rabbit. Saw a groundhog, but I didn't get it. That new dog had to run off. He would have got it for me. He was he was wasn't such a good hunting dog. I'd have shot him by I'd have shot him by now. Sheriff would have been on you for doing something like that, Judd. Law never told me what to do, what I could do with my dogs, and won't be telling me now. Judd says he laughs, <laughs> waves his hand, starts the engine, and pickup pulls away. So. Now Marty's lied again. Told his told his folks and Judd that he hadn't seen that dog. So a couple of things to think about. So what does why is Marty telling his mom he's not hungry? I kind of figured that one out, I hope. And what is he gonna do with this dog now that Judd's come looking for him? How's he gonna handle this? He can't hide the dog forever, so what's he gonna do? What is he going to do with this dog? I'll write some questions down, answer those questions, and send them back to me. Have fun thinking about our story today.